It is hard to believe that we're already coming to the end of our speaker program for the day, but my goodness, do we have a closing keynote for you. Ada Paris is a visionary in experience design, pushing the boundaries and redefining our perception of value and impact. Through her immersive experiences, she creates transformative catalysts that inspire us to think differently and unlock new potentials, for, uh, new possibilities for personal growth, innovation, and societal change. Through her work, Ada fosters a deep understanding of the interconnectedness between ecology, technology, innovation, and human experiences. Blending creativity, empathy, and a deep understanding of tech to craft immersive encounters that transcend traditional boundaries, she creates immersive experiences that engage the senses, challenge assumptions, and provoke introspection. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Ada Paris. Hi. <laughs> it's really weird being on the stage in a nightclub and not dancing. I may have to do that later. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I'm absolutely stoked to be down in Cornwall. Um, I also made a point of actually saying that I didn't want to just come for the event. So I came down a couple of days early and I spent all day yesterday at the Eden Project. I have found my spiritual home. Oh my gosh. And even talking about it, I get goosebumps. Um, so, I never s stand up anywhere and say that I'm an expert. I'm a storyteller. And I always start with the same quote because it helps keep me grounded. And the fact somebody asked me earlier, um, does it get easier sp speaking on stage? No. I always, if you see, saw me upstairs, hyperventilating. Um, the, the quote that I use is, the purpose of a storyteller is not to tell you how to think, but to give you questions to think upon. That's what I want to do. Success for me from any talk is about getting you to think differently. Let's see. Ah, so, um, part of this talk, what I wanted to do is, I also claim the fact that I am a neurodivergent peacock. So it's the fact, that is why I, I've, I believe and I understand that my neurodivergence is what has helped me to recognize patterns in many worlds and helped me to kind of form the framework that I use now. And also I'm going to talk you through some of the stuff that I'm doing at the moment. So I thought that given that I'm coming down here, I wanted to do a bit of research into Cornwall because some of the patterns that I've seen recently is connecting the way we approach regeneration in nature with the potential for our emerging technologies. Um, and so what I wanted to do is start by saying, what if we could imagine that regeneration would give us a new way of really thinking about creating equity and diversity and decentralized systems? What if I could tell you that actually regeneration, the process of regeneration in nature could help us do that? And I wanted to give an example of that, which is the Eden Project. What if we can vision really big and think about what are the patterns we're recognizing? So, what, I've, what I really believe is that the Cornish landscape really holds some of the answers to helping you develop new technologies in a way that we have greater potential than we've probably had for a long time. Um, I believe that places like Heartlands also has the opportunity to learn, to help us understand that because from my research, understanding that that was, that oh, that place was a place of mining. And now what they've done is there's been some money invested into this, into this land, in this, this area, to try and bring back the heritage, but also to try and develop a way of um, creating new spaces. So, I'm going to start with a question. I have realised that this question is a question I've been trying to ask myself all of my life. If you met my mother, she would say that I was a, as a child, I was a social justice warrior in Afropuffs. The only thing that would make me cry was injustice. Not just for me, but for nature, for plants, for everything. And so, at 51 years old, um, the question that... I am going to ask you is I really would like you to take a moment and really think about this question. 
because I believe it's the only question that we should be asking ourselves right now, especially as entrepreneurs and innovators and people who are developing new and emerging technologies. And that question is what type of ancestor do you want to be? And it's interesting because when I ask that question, sometimes people go, oh, well, that's really ego-driven. No, it's not. Because we have to recognize that everything we are, everything we do, every choice we make, every choice that we decide we're not going to make, leaves a legacy. It leaves a ripple effect. It leaves a pattern, whether you have children or not. And so I think it's important for us to really take the moment to answer that question, to think about that question. And I have made most of my life, I realize now, that I've been working towards answering that. So where are we now? We are finally coming out of a pandemic, probably the first of many, if, if we're really going to be honest. But as devastating as the COVID-19 pandemic was, we also have to recognize that most of us here, in fact, all of us here, are still here because of people who didn't look like us, didn't have lived experiences the same as us. And so there is an understanding that we came from a point of actually recognizing that diversity of thought, diversity of experience is powerful. It helped us get to where we are now in terms of finding solutions to some of the problems that we had. But we also recognized at that time that what we thought was normal was broken. It was a myth that we ended up, oh, now it's back on screen. We ended up in this place where we realized that we were ready for a change. I have been mapping patterns that I saw for the last 10 years. I have a mind map that is 10 years old of words and patterns and all sorts of things that really emerged that helped me to recognize some of this. But it's only since the pandemic that my work has really taken off. Why? Because people are ready for something different. Understanding that what we perceived as normal was broken. The other thing that the pandemic did is it helped us to come back together. There was a revitalization of people coming together for community. This is a brilliant photo. It always makes me smile because this was the first time I came to Cornwall. This is a Trubarwith. Sorry if I butchered the pronunciation. But what it represents is the time when I came down and it was during the pandemic. And the pandemic helped us to recognize that actually the small things in life are what matter. That we come back together and we can create new this sense of belonging. But in order to really think about how we change things, we also have to understand where we've come from. Um, and doing my research for a lot of the work I did, realized that many of our systems and structures are based on colonization, extraction. And they actually go back to René Descartes, French philosopher, who, dis who said that we as humans should be the masters and possessors of nature. Think about that. The masters and possessors of nature. And all of our systems, all of our structures, everything has been built on extraction. What would happen if suddenly you started to think about how, what would be my business model? What would be my revenue model? How would my business run if it didn't belong, if it didn't depend on humans or nature as capital? That's the challenge I set to all of you. So, as I said, you know, this is something that I've been looking at for all of my life. I could, later on, when we're dancing or what have you, I can tell you the whole story. But there was this moment of clarity in recognizing that everything is connected. Everything is connected. And we spend far too much time trying to go, this is my piece of the pie. And that if something's going to change, that means that I'm going to lose out. No. We have, to be, we have to recognize, actually the pandemic also helped us to recognize this, that there is space and place for chaos. We have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. We have to recognize that change can take time, but we also need to recognize that when we're talking about some of these things, it may not be in our lifetime. The change that needs to happen may not be in our lifetime. And so a few months ago, 
I was out in the English countryside walking with a friend who works in water conservation. And I really wanted him to talk to me about what does regeneration, what happens when nature starts to regenerate? What happens when we as humans start to work towards regeneration? And he started to talk to me about the need for a found, you need to set the foundation, you need to have really good foundational species. You need to set the conditions to ensure that nature can happen. You need to ensure that you have the right conditions. I, I'll give you an example. I was, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Brazil, out hiking in the forest, and we came across this area where there were these cacti that had been burnt, black and charred, in this whole ground. But what we noticed is that there were actually spritz, uh, shoots of green coming through. And the reason that happened is because the ground was fertile. When you were talking about emerging technologies, we also need to make sure that the ground is fertile. And when my friend was talking about the foundational species, I started to recognize, he was talking about the fact that if water is dirty and you further pollute it, you're only gonna get more dirt. If we're talking about Web3 and emerging technologies, and our AI platforms are broken, the language models that create them are broken, and we continue to use them, we are only gonna get more broken. A couple of, in the summer, earlier in the summer, I was at a conference in uh, South of France with a load of tech entrepreneurs who have invested in loads of models, and they spent two days talking about the ethics of AI. We have to do this, we've got to do this, we've gotta get it right. And we spent a long time talking about the ethics of AI. And I challenged them and I said, that's fine, but you've just spent two days talking about this stuff. And most of you have made your money in platforms that you know are broken, where the language models are broken. Nothing is gonna change if we don't change our behavior. So we also have to recognize that we are part of the problem. And you've gotta remember, it's not about what it looks like. It's about the ethics, and the, it's about the ethics behind it. I look, like a neuro, I look like a disco ball right now. But you know what? It is about what's in, inside. It doesn't matter what it looks like. We spend so much time trying to focus on marketing and branding and all of these things. But if we are going to create the world that we want, need, and desire, especially in this current economic crisis, especially in this current climate change crisis, we have to get back to basics and understand that it's about what lies underneath. So before I move on, I also want to talk about what technology is to me. Because this is where some of the work that I do really started. Technology to me means three things. They are tools that we can use to help us understand and navigate our relationship with ourselves, with others, and with our environment. Self other and environment, and I recognize those patterns in digital technology. I also, I was brought up, uh, I was brought up Catholic, went to a convent school, you can tell, and I was taught to believe in God, that I can, who I cannot see, that helps me understand my relationship with myself, with others, and with my environment. I'm also a massive hippie, and also understood that shamanism there are think, plant medicine, sound, what have you, that you use that help you understand self, other, and environment. Think about the COVID-19 virus. It helped us understand and navigate our relationship with self, other, and environment. So to me, technology is about relationships. And when I talk about technology, I mean all of that, not just the digital. And I think it's important to say that. So, talking to my marine uh, conservationist friend, we started to talk about what are the foundational species? How can we start to change things? Now, one of the things that he does is he travels around the country planting seagrass to help regenerate our systems and structures. And as he spoke about that, I was like, well, actually, I can start to see parallels in what you're talking about. What is the foundational species of what we're doing in technology? AI, artificial intelligence, learning models, whatever you want to call it, is already here. It's in everything, whether we see it or not. And one of the things that we recognized is that 
if we are going to do this right, we also have to be honest about the biases that are in those systems and structures. There is no point trying to build something new on something that is broken and pretend that you're doing good. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. We have to be honest and say, there are biases, there are things that need to change, and I'm going to be one of the people to try and change it by asking questions, by challenging. But what we also recognize is that in nature and in technology, diversity is key. I hate the term, the business case for diversity, because on a microscopic level, we would not exist without diversity. Everything else is choice. That's about thinking about being a good ancestor. The recognition that sometimes we have to, instead of having this top-down approach to defining what the problem is, because I've decided in my ivory tower, this is what the problem is, and I'm going to produce something to fix it, that's really egotistical. What we need to do is really start to look at how we can bring decentralized systems and structures into things by bringing people around the table to redefine a problem. People who have a different lived experience, different understanding, different way of being. Because then you, then you have a hope of really getting closer to what the actual problem is. But that also starts with understanding that we need to understand what the value system is. So I have a framework. After all of this 10 years of mind mapping, I have a framework that I use. I'll tell you the name at the end. Um, that once I saw that technology is really about uh, relationships, these interconnected relationships, I started to look at what are the patterns? Where else am I seeing these patterns? And this framework has five phases. Leave, breathe, grow, flow and ground. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through the framework. I'm going to give you some examples at the end. And then I've got a little immersion, a little immersive experience that um, we, we, we should have some time to get you to really think about. And I wanted to show you what this framework looks like in practice. So given where we're at, we're at now with the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, economic systems. One of the things, one of the most beautiful things that I noticed, I don't know about the rest of you, during the pandemic, was that nature started to reclaim its path. We saw animals coming out and doing whatever they wanted. You know, this ability for nature to regenerate itself. Remember, nature creates no waste. And so... Now I understand that ecology and regeneration should be at the center of everything that we do. Oh, goosebumps. We should, it should be at the <laughs> regeneration should really be at the center of what we do. Because when I started to look into this, we also have to recognize that there are problems. Because I was born in London. I, you can tell by my accent, I'm a Southeast Londoner. But I really wanted to try and understand how to make this relevant to you. So looking and trying to understand some of the conflicts that happen that you can then think about how you bring into, your into what you're building. So one of the things that I discovered is that 75% of Cornish land is farming. It's agriculture. But you also have certain species that are being decimated and that are lost. How do you then start to have that conversation about regenerating the land when 75% of it is economic? It, it, the, the rest of the country, the rest of your area de de depends on it. Those questions, those conversations are the same conversations you should be having in, when you're developing technologies. There are these tensions that we can't get away from. We have to recognize that everything is connected. As I said, going back to the biases, we also need to recognize that there will be biases in some of these things that we're talking about. But we also have to ask those questions, be upfront, and understand that we all have biases, we all have ways of doing. But if you flatten the structures, if you bring different people, different mindsets, different ways of being in, around the table to redefine a problem and start by redefining what are the values that we need to have, We've spent fortunes redefining problems. 
we're in a time and a space now, and I do believe we're still in this window of opportunity where what we should be doing is starting with the values. What are the values that we want, need, and desire for the society that we want? Because that's when we can start to build things. So you start with leave. Let's leave the old ways behind and think about new values. What are the values that we want as a society? The second bit is breathe. How do we remove the tensions in the system? Those biases that we pretend aren't there, they're not going to go away unless we face them. So how are we going to breathe, remove those tensions in the system? What are the new theories of change that we think can change things? Number one, recognize that everything is connected. How many of you have heard of the UN Sustainability Development Goals? How many of you would, well, I'm not going to ask you actually, I don't want to put you on the spot, but what tends to happen, there are 17 goals that are set by the UN. Oh, there are 17 goals that are set. What tends to happen is most people go, I'm going to focus on education. I'm going to focus on water. I'm going to focus on this and carve out the bit that you think that you can own and capitalize on. But actually, we have to remember that everything is connected. So rather than focusing on one, focus on how is my business impacted by and how is the business that I am developing going to impact every single one of those things. And rather than using people as research subjects and focus groups, get them to come around the table and have the conversation about how we can change things because that's what you've been doing. When I looked at the Cornish um, regeneration strategy, it's brilliant because what's happening is that people are break, they're bringing in local people to have conversations about what it does it mean for you. The few days that I've been here, I've had some great conversations, especially with cab drivers. Great, telling me exactly what they think about the Duchy of Cornwall versus what is really needed for the land. If you're developing emerging technologies, bring those people in, bring them closer, because that's where success lies, in changing those and understanding that everybody has a voice. If you want an example, this is a friend of mine, Tom Keller. I uh, met him a little while ago. Um, he has developed, when we people say, oh, we, we can't do it, we can. Tom has developed a framework for human-centered AI. It's, it's, it's a brilliant start. I, I still have an issue with it because it's human-centered. Because we have to recognize that, I'm sorry to disappoint you, <clears throat> but as humans, we're probably the most insignificant species on this planet. We're the biggest egos, definitely. But we always design things from this human-centered perspective. What if we focus on this idea of regeneration? How is your business, how is your product, how is it going to regenerate everything? Buckminster Fuller. I love this quote because this, I feel that where we are right now is the perfect opportunity for this. He says that you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the, the existing model obsolete. We're in the window of opportunity that is really exciting right now. We changed our behavior. We changed our way of seeing. We changed our own personal measures of success. Every single one of us, regardless of whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, during a pandemic, had that moment of existential crisis. Somebody mentioned it on the stage here. There are people who want to do better but don't know how to do better. Let's come together and try and think about how can we change the models. One of the ways is to ask yourself, how can I make sure that every aspect of my business is regenerative, rather than carbon offsetting, rather than all of these other air miles, what have you. Focus on regeneration, focus on what are the values. Think about how can you change what you do. One of the things that I'm doing with my business is I am trying to make my business model act like water. So during a pandemic, I heard this great quote that's, you know, sometimes you hear a quote that just stops you in your tracks. And it was really simple. 
And it made a lot of sense. I'm like, shit, why did I, sorry, why did I never think of that before? It was a flood is water reclaiming its path. Nature will always reclaim its path. Why can't we just get ourselves out of the way and work with it rather than trying to work against it? That's why we have regeneration at the center of what we do. The next part of the framework, so we've had leave. Leave the old ways behind, create new values. We've had breathe. What are the tensions that are making us hold our breath and holding things in place? Admitting that there are biases in our systems is one of them. The next is grow. What are the tools, technologies, rituals, behaviors that we need to try and make those values true? To try and make that hypothesis true? One of the first things is to step outside our comfort zone. Go into a conference where it's always the same people, the same names, the same faces. You're only going to get more of the same. I worked at London Business School for six years, and I don't mind saying this publicly. I've done it before. But I worked there as a secretary putting together the marketing bit of the MBA program for six years, you know the course materials never changed. How are things going to change if we're always thinking the same? We need to step outside of our echo chambers and talk to people and have these conversations because it makes us think differently. Yes, it can be uncomfortable, but we can surprise ourselves. And we can surprise others. We may find our next board member, our next CEO, The way I got invited to be chair of Mental Health First Aid England is because I challenged the CEO. In a podcast interview, he was talking about my whole self. Bring your whole self to work. And I was like, well, it's all right for you as a white guy. Me as a black woman who dresses like a peacock or a disco ball, that's not always going to be accepted. And he challenged me and said, if you want to change things, then join us. That's what you should be doing when you're looking for your board people, when you're looking for investors. Those things that are going to challenge you and make you feel uncomfortable because that's where change will happen. So that's grow. Because I love a quote. I found this one that... How many of you have children? This is a First Nations indigenous quote that says... We don't inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. With the, choices or the, the, with, with the choices that we're making or not, we are constantly borrowing. The stuff that's happening here now with this climate crisis and everything else, is that came from years, that's the 80s and the 90s. The stuff that we're doing right now, the bit technologies that we are building, we may not even see the impacts of those things. And so this is why I say that we need to ask these questions. So that is about the fourth element of, the, um, of my framework, which is where this question, what type of ancestor do you want to be, comes in. Because many indigenous cultures think in seven generations. They recognize that the change that they are trying to build, the things that we're trying to, the world that we are trying to build, the world that we need to create, may not happen in our lifetime, and that is okay. But we have to be honest that we are part of the problem. We have to be honest that we need to change things. We have to make choices, even the ones that we don't like. Even those times when we say, you know what, it's a choice. I remember, rather than saying I made a mistake, I focus on sometimes thinking about It's a choice that I made based on the information I chose to believe was true at the time. We all do it. The information we chose to believe is true at the time. Just think about where you get your information. Why you make the choices you do. Because, as I said, it goes back to that point. What type of ancestor do you want to be? I've got to a stage in my life where I am conscious consciously every day making choices about the type of ancestor I want to be. It's the reason I decided I wanted to come here and spend a couple of days before just coming on the stage because I want to understand the land, I want to understand the people, I want to understand the culture. I've changed my bank to a more ethical bank. I try and travel by train rather than just by plane. 
everything that you're doing, when you're developing new technologies, when you are making choices about who to employ and how to do this, has a ripple effect, one that you may not see. Because, oh, I love the Eden Project. <laughs> but it also left me with some questions. If we are going to make change, how do we measure success? It was a great time there, beautiful time there. But what do you, how do you measure success and how are you going to enable others to measure the success of what you put out there? I have learnt that market share doesn't matter if there's no planet, which is why I say that regeneration should be at the heart of everything that we're doing. Because when we talk about we, we feel this, we feel this, you feel that. I've, who's we? There is a great, oh, there's a great um, paper called Making Kim with Machines. I highly recommend you all read it. There is a, one of the most beautiful books that I've read in a very long time is The Spell of the Sensuous by David Abram. And there's a line in there that hit me like a ton of bricks. And it is, we are only human in contact and conviviality with that which is not human. We only understand our humanness in relation to other. So when we're talking about we, we have to be mindful. Who is the we? Are we just talking about people in the global north? And the impact of what we build doesn't matter to what happens in the global south? Does it only matter to people in Cornwall? Or does it matter to people in London as well? When you're talking about we and you're developing your technologies and your ideas, please be mindful about who you're including and who you're excluding and why. Because we have to remember that what we are creating is creating us. We cannot get away from that. I love this image because it is a constant reminder that everything that is out there is impacting us as well. And so it is time to ask nature. This is a brilliant website. I absolutely love this. If you haven't seen it, it's great because you can go on there and you can say, what is the community? Oh, I, I, actually, in fact, I was consulting for a blockchain company and they wanted to know about social, uh, the best social networks. I'm like, yes, best social networks, humans. No, bacteria. Bacteria creates the best social networks. When you're thinking about your business idea, just go and check. What does community look like in nature? How does nature solve these problems? Because that gives you another way of being regenerative if you understand that nature creates no waste. So, coming to the end, don't worry. But we're in a time, one of the be benefits of the pandemic is that it made us slow down. We were running ahead, creating new things, all of these new technologies. The fact that it frightens the head out of me, the fact that we new AI, pla AI platforms can be built and developed and funded in four weeks, that terrifies me. We've had this opportunity to slow down. We've had this opportunity to ask ourselves more questions. Let's just pause and take a moment and take a breath. And just because we can doesn't mean we should. Oppenheimer movies out. Just saying. So, going to give you some quick examples of things that you can do. So the framework, leave, breathe, grow, flow, ground. Leave. What can you do? We need new values. Put empathy at the heart of what you're doing. Not just empathy for those who look like you, for those who have the same budget as you, for those who have the same lived experience of you. Empathy and compassion for nature. What I learned a huge lesson in that when I was in, uh, in, in Brazil the other day. Because we went out for a hike, great. Had a great time. Forgot that it gets dark really quickly. And we had to hike back in the dark. I'm from southeast London. We're hiking back, and my friend was like, oh, yeah, we're in Jaguar country. And then all of a sudden, I can hear all these noises. And she was like, look, what it is is we have this, the way that the indigenous people talk about it is that you have to have empathy and compassion with nature. We are in nature's, she said, we're in nature's back garden. An animal's not going to come and attack you just because you're walking. 
if you have empathy and compassion, suddenly I became brave. I discovered my inner mountain goat. <laughs> have empathy and compassion for those who are, you are trying to work with. Put empathy, compassion, regeneration as your core values at the heart of what you're trying to build and build up from there. Change the status quo. Who, has anyone heard of Client Earth? I absolutely love what they are doing. They're a law firm who have decided they have one client, and that is Earth. And they will sue companies because their policies, their CSR, their features are damaging to the Earth. What could you do, what could be possible if you broke your own models, you broke your own systems and reframed it and came back with a different answer? If you could look at the, having a business that does not depend on nature or humans as capital, what could be possible? Think big, think huge. Think Elon Musk huge, trying to colonize Mars. And then think about what are the practical steps to make it happen. To even a small fraction of that could make a huge shift in what you're doing. This is uh, my friend's company. And I've heard uh, Amy, if she's here. Sorry, if you're here. Uh, yes, loved what you were saying about leadership. This is about leadership. Things will have to change if you have... You have to have regenerative leadership. You have to be adaptive. This idea that we have a five-year plan and that's what we're going to stick to because that's what we need to get to. The world is changing so quickly. And if we recognize that everything is connected, then we have to recognize that we as leaders also need to be regenerative. The way that we think, the way that we operate, how we measure our own personal success needs to be regenerative. I've said it before, market share doesn't matter if there is no planet. As much as we want to do all this wonderful stuff and create this, the, the latest food delivery app, and we've got shareholders and all of this, and we want to be the whatever, it doesn't matter if there is no planet. That should be the foundational level of anything that we're doing. Because better is possible if we ask ourselves, what type of ancestor do you want to be? And we keep that question front of mind every day. There are so many examples that I have seen just by doing some research on how Cornwall is actually doing that. There are lessons to be learned from that. If you're stuck, just have a look at the regeneration strategy. Have a look at the tensions between the Duchy of Cornwall and the farmers. Have a look at how the Eden Project is actually trying to do some of that. How it's built its systems and structures. How it brings people in with this sense of curiosity. With this flatter structure. With this sense of ownership. With these de decentralized systems and structures. Because people think decentralization is blockchain. Sorry to disappoint you, but we can trace it back to pre-Mexican civilizations that used decentralized systems and structures for agriculture. My name, Ada, is Nigerian. My father was Nigerian. Igbo, all Igbo firstborn daughters are called Ada. Our name in systems and structures are decentralized. Decentralization is not just about the tech. It's about a way of thinking, nodes of possibility. Every single one of us has the opportunity to be an innovator because we're human, we're problem solvers. We like to put things in museums, but we're also problem solvers. And so, the framework, the, it's a deliberately provocative name because I think it's important. But I didn't want to give you the name of the framework at the beginning because instantly it creates an idea, an impression. The framework is called cyborg shamanism. Great, right? Weird. I know. When I first came up with the name, people were like, oh my God, no one's going to want to work with you. You're too weird. And now, pandemic, and they're like, oh, Ada. <laughs> but look, joking aside, 
right? There are different ways of doing things, different ways of being, and I think it's important for us to really start asking ourselves the crucial questions. I'm now going to give you an example of how it, the framework happens in action. So we have leave, leave the old ways behind, create new values, breathe. What are the tensions in the system that we're turning a blind eye to, but we still can't exhale? What's the theory of change? Grow. What are the tools, technologies, rituals, behaviors that we need to change, to make this happen? Flow. What type of ancestor do you want to be? And ground. How do we turn this into kinship? How do we turn this into a movement? I'm going to let you listen to this. I'm going to ask you to trust me. This disco ball on the stage. I'm going to ask you to trust me. Close your eyes. Sit comfortably. Close your eyes. And just listen. And then I want to ask you another question. Open your eyes. What did you experience? Anybody? Nature. Gun. Fear. Okay. So that is a soundscape that I've made. That I'm going to send you a link to the full version. 25-minute soundscape that takes you on the journey of the creation of Earth. The, you go into a Colombian rainforest. You go into a cave. You have a shamanic experience, and then you hear deforestation, polar ice caps melting, uh, refugee, uh, climate refugees, and then you hear the birth of a child. Now, I use the questioning that I've just shared with you to create that. What you've just experienced is a virtual reality experience. Because the four components of virtual reality is a virtual environment. The best virtual environment is your own imagination. You don't always need a headset interactivity, sensory feedback, and immersion. So when you start to ask yourselves those types of questions about values, about identity, all of those things, you can fundamentally shift how you perceive technology. How you, sh how you've, you can shift the relationship that you create. And you actually give people more agency. So I'm going to stop there, because I've realized I've also gone over. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, I will be around later if you want to ask any more questions. Yeah. Uh, we are going to allow just a couple of times, a uh, couple of minutes for questions because I know a few of you will have some burning ones. So we're going to use Slido. Um, Gary's queued in at the back um, with a microphone as well, and I think it's the same code actually as the last one. So if you've still got it from the panel. 
um, in your browser, fire it up. If not, we'll see if we can get it on screen. Oops. Um, I've got a question just while we're waiting. Okay. Um, we're sort of, there's tech founders, there's um, startups in the room, there's people who are established in business. What's the first thing they should do when they get back to the office tomorrow? It, just because it popped in my head, take your shoes off and stand on the ground and just be grateful that it's still here. That's, that's, that's not first. what I was expecting. No, that's the first one. That's the first one. But if you want to, if you, um, I think it would be to redefine how, what you do. So one of the proudest thing, one of the things that I'm proud of, the most proud of, is the fact that my mother can tell people what I do. If what you're doing is so complicated that you can only do it, tell it in a PowerPoint presentation or anything, I think that you need to rethink. I think it's important to understand that we don't leave people behind because that's what's happened. We're in this time and place now where so many people are left behind. If we're developing things only for the metaverse and virtual reality, what happens to the we? Who's the we? So if you can redefine what you do in a very... Uh, simple terms so that other people understand it. You also have another way of thinking about what and why and how and the potential for funding and growth. Mm. Thank you. Uh, how are we doing on the slide? Out? I Does have got a oh. question here for you. Um, Gary's voice came from nowhere there. Sorry, I can see. <laughs> this <laughs> is the, the dark, voice of the, the Mr. Ron's. <laughs> <laughs> oh. there's, there's, a, there's a target reference. Um, so the question I have on here uh, uh, that's a question, but I think it's still important um, from Ellie. Uh, went to a training recently that talked about finding your tribe, and I think I just did in Ada. Uh, we need to connect fully. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Ellie, uh, uh, I went to a training recently that, really, that talked about finding your tribe, yep. and I think I just did in Ada, and we need to connect fully. So, Ellie, wherever you are, find Ada later on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you guys need to talk. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any more coming in. Does anybody want to ask Ada their questions yeah. directly rather than... There we go, yeah. Paul. Hang on. <laughs> it's all right, I realise, yeah, it's a fab. Go, go ahead. We've got a microphone coming. You talked about the seventh generation, and I'm familiar yeah. with that, but what is it, do you think, in, what's that, 175 years' time, that would, if we're considering what kind of ancestor we want to be, what is it that, in 175 years' time, our nth grandchildren would be considered anathema? What is the thing they'd want to be, that if we would be doing now, that they would be ashamed of and would want to pull down our statues or whatever? I think our short-termism, the fact that we think, we think we're thinking long-term, but most of the time we're not. The fact that we sometimes focus on building things for a quick exit. You know, it's, it's that balance between doing what's right because it's the right thing to do and doing what's right because it feeds my ego. I think the, um, it's interesting. That soundscape is actually called the myth of the ego because I realise that the link between colonialism, capitalism and climate change is the ego. The fact that, look, we've all got egos. Definitely got ego. But we have to be able to recognise when our ego comes in the way of what we're trying to do, because we don't know what the next generations are going to look like. We don't even know if we will exist as this kind of, you know, in the, the bodies and the things that we are now. Because I've got this, I, I mean, one, uh, an idea. One of the things that I want to do is start recreating time capsules to write letters to our future selves to ask the questions and those recognition. If I was running a workshop with all of you, what I always do is I give everybody, at the end of it, I give you a blank, uh, blank postcard and say, just write a letter to yourself with the things that you've taken from today and the ideas and that kind of enthusiasm that we all have at the end of a conference, like, oh my God, that was amazing. And then you get back into the world and something, everything else takes over. But I would get you to write those postcards and then 30 days later, I would post them to you as a check-in to see if you really kept your own promises. Because if we can't keep our own promises, how can we keep promises to anybody else? 
and recognizing that every single voice is a voice. Every single voice is a node of possibility, which is how I kind of think of the, the potential for blockchain and decentralized systems. So I think that we need to think longer and recognize that things will change, not necessarily in our lifetime. But I don't, but I also think we need to be careful of the, of the way the, the term long-termism has been co-opted because I think it's dangerous. There's a lot of stuff. If you don't know it, go and have a look online. The way that the terminology of long-termism has been framed and taken out of context also creates these tensions. So, yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. I think we've possibly got time for one more question, um, and then we have to announce the winner of our Pitch Startup competition. Gary? I've got one on here. Um, I'm just checking it. I mean, yeah, I've, uh, it's one that's very recently coming. I think it looks like the best one, and I'm sure Ada will be hanging around for those of you that didn't, yeah? Yes, I was hanging around. More. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we here can't we go. hear you so very well. Sorry, Sorry. Gary. <laughs> I've been telling people how to use a microphone all day. I'm <laughs> not using my own things. Uh, so in this economy, uh, the businesses with the best models get funded and survive longer. Um, idealistic businesses don't. What practical ways are there for idealism? <sighs> Great question. Um... So there's a couple of things happening at the moment. Um, so I'm not a big fan of philanthropy because I think a lot of it's wrapped up in ego. Um, there is, if you haven't heard of them, there's an organization, a charity called Lang Kelly Chase who are a huge funder. And I was at a conference, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation conference where I presented cyborg shamanism as well. And Lang Kelly Chase on stage announced that they are closing their organization because they realize that the way that funding works is still colonial, it's still capitalistic, and they want to change things. So, oh, I need goosebumps. And so, I think, that I feel that there is, the tide is turning, that there are more people who are thinking about this long-termist way of funding things, I definitely believe that there is space for the, you know, the idealists, the, the people coming up with ideas. Um, challenge the status quo. So I challenge banks to build an artist residency program in their organization, not because I want a studio and I want to sit there and paint, but because I have a different way of looking and viewing the world. And so if you can convince people who have a very particular, especially the old guard, the way that money is distributed is uneven. But if, especially if you can, if you can help people recognize themselves in what you're doing, you're in for a chance. Um, I last year became the chair of the center, the advisory group for the Center for Cultural Values. It's based out of Leeds University. We advise government and policymakers on what is culture. And one of the first things I did is I went and spoke to the funders, because it's a research thing. And I said to them, how are you measured? How are you measured in your organization? How are you measured? What is your measure of success? Because if I can understand what their narrative is, what their story is, how to help them see themselves in things, then it starts to change. Because it was amazing to talk to them in that way, because suddenly they're talking about, this is the business five-year strategy, but actually where I want to push it is here. And these are the things that I want to do. And what you do is you end up with somebody who, who supports you, your tribe. You start to, there are people out there. Things like this, inviting people like me to come and talk about cyborgs and shaman and all sorts of things is great. Go to, go to places where you normally wouldn't find yourself. Step outside your comfort zone because there are people who are thinking and trying to change the way that things are funded. I'm not saying everything, but if your measures of success are about regeneration and we are in this current climate of climate change and all of those things, there are more and more people who are starting to think the same, especially just as we're, we're still emerging from the pandemic. Yep. Ada, thank you so much. Thank Please you. give a warm hand. Thank you. Thank you.